have their spring training camps. A couple of my cousins went to live there after retirement. My cousin Ken Edom lives near Orlando. A few months before writing this book, I was in the state doing a site visit for the Florida State Humanities Council in the state of Petersburg. Ken drove over and then drove me back to his home. I teased him about living in Shaq's house when I walked through the front door. Ken's father was a good friend of my father. Two guys falling in love with the Marshall girls. Enid was my father's girlfriend. Ken's father fell forever. Talking to Ken about old times is like being up in a sports booth. The game looks different and makes better sense just before it goes into the official record book. I guess here's where folks call the errors they see on the feet. It's just Ken and me talking and eating Chinese food, a family tradition. Ken no longer needs to read the fortune cookie. He has done well. He did what many men, men in our family have always done. He has worked at one job and retired. Calvert. Joe DiMaggio, Jackie. This is what many of the old guys did. Willie Mays was a fool to put on a New York Mets uniform. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Roger Clemens might be buried naked. <laughs> it's from Ken that I get another picture of my father. It's like now I have a baseball card to go with the memories. Into the night and another day, Ken and I talk about fatherhood and how to raise children. He is separated from his son's mother who lives in New Jersey, so the goodnight kisses must be made over the phone. Ken seems to talk to his son every day. I can count the number of telephone conversations I had with my own father. I could try to multiply them and still come away with a single digit. Mm -hmm. Spring training, and suddenly you're old. If luck knows your name, the old baseball team might invite you to the camp to coach and advise the rookies. You might be asked to teach them how to bunt or steal a base. Much of the time, you're standing around in the field feeling the sun on your shoulders, teasing you to believe you can still catch and run with the best. I look over at Ken, and he drives me to the Orlando airport. He seems very happy with the cards of life. Playing card games is another thing I can't do. Add it to the list. Mm -hmm. I reach into the trunk of Ken's car and grab my luggage. I'm heading north to write a book. The title is going to be The Fifth Inning. Mm -hmm. My cousin Ken is going to be in it. On the airplane, I open another notebook. Make notes. In terms of getting yourself physically in shape, uh, I think of my friend Charles Johnson, who was a novelist, wrote Middle Passage and Dreamer. Uh, he's also a black belt. He talks about just getting in shape physically. Okay, uh, and I say that in terms of some of us uh, are getting bad postures uh, from you know how we type, but there's a physical thing that you need to do, uh, especially if you're tackling certain genres. You know, I think if you're tackling a novel. You know, you really have to get yourself in, in shape. And so that's important. The thing also in terms of reading, I think, comes back to uh, promote the Bennington program for a second here. Liam Rector started this program, which I actually went through um, and, and changed. <laughs> and one thing that I didn't realize until maybe the third year I was up there is I had a conversation with Liam, and he said, we are not here to help people to become writers. And I said, well, what have I been doing the last couple of years? He said, we are here to create men and women of letters. Okay? Uh, and, and that was a whole different approach. And, I, and I, I kept that in my mind. And then I remember something the poet laureate Ted Kuzer said. And he said that it was a, for every poem that you write, you should read 100 poems. Mm -hmm. You know, one to 100. Now, that's not really a lot when you think about, that's like a, a book of poetry, really. You see? So if you look at, you know, one, one, that's not bad. Okay. Now, let me connect this to the spoken word situation in, in D.C. at a place called Bus Boys and Poet, mm -hmm. where it's like ground center, uh, ground, ground zero in terms of, of, of poetry. Now, it's a bookstore, and Don, who runs the bookstore, was concerned about theft and stealing. And I asked him, what's being stolen? I see all these poets in there. I said, are the books of poetry disappearing? I mean, are people <laughs> smuggling the books? He said, oh, no, that, that's, that's staying there. You know, you know, people getting little calendar books and stuff. But, and I said, wait a minute. I mean, all these poets are here. The books are disappearing, but it's not the poetry books. And I made note of that, you see? Um, because what I found many times is that people want to talk about poetry in terms of their own work, but don't want to talk about other people's work and what they learn from it. Now, I'm a literary activist, so what I always emphasize, and being this is a place where killings used to be, is a literary tradition. 
Mm -hmm. All you hear, extend the tradition. You see? Mm -hmm. Extend the tradition. See? And this is why I challenge you and tell you have to be visionary. See? Right now, we have some good caretakers. I don't think there's any jazz musician out here who goes and waits for the next Whitney Marcellus album to find out where jazz is going. <laughs> he doesn't do that. But he does a really good job in terms of telling you, you know, what has taken place. In terms of beauty, in terms of art. I mean, when you hear Whitney Marcellus explain jazz, it's phenomenal. But he's not, he's not Sun Ra. He's not going to say next step is, next step is Jupiter. You know? But you here, at this particular time, you have to be visionary in terms of your work. And that means you've got to get in shape to do it. And, and, and this thing of tradition is very, very important in terms of one. Once you emphasize that, then you always go back and master your craft. You see? Like the only reason why Cornell West wears suits is because the boys wear suits. Mm -hmm. See? Or I went to my son said, I really wear suits because I, it's classically I respect the music. So you have to say, okay, if you're extending the tradition, you have to bring that every time you sit down. You see? Because you continue the tradition. Mm -hmm. You see? I mean, when you look at people like Walter Rodney, some of these other people that you see the poster, or, or, or Malcolm X reading the dictionary. Not sleeping with the dictionary, reading the dictionary. All we do is credit to Harry Mullen. You know, what happens, this is the challenge that we face in terms of as new artists, okay? And that's, I think, when you see anybody up here, hopefully what happens, you've seen people who maybe have um, done things in which their lives have suffered. The child didn't get hugged, you know? I mean, I look at the relationship between Alice Walker and Rebecca Walker, mm -hmm. yeah. you say? And someone at the end of the day, you might say, I don't know if the book is as is more important than my child, mm -hmm. and these are the another mm -hmm. situation. I think that I think your ex example. I know what your priorities are, you know, in terms of your family, and that's a thing that you never want to have people who are successful, you see, but you don't know what they have given up to be there. Mm -hmm. You remember that that situation in, in the Dutchman? We play Lula. They said that, that if Bessie Smith had just killed a white person, she wouldn't have sang the blues. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. So those are things to remember about the tradition mm -hmm. and the craft.